Good evening, I'm NET News Director Dennis Kellogg. Thanks for joining us on this special edition of Speaking of Nebraska. Governor Pete Ricketts is back to answer your questions during tonight's town hall discussion, along with Annette Smith, the Chief Executive Officer of Nebraska Department of Health and Human Services, and Dr. James uh, Linder as well, the Chief Executive Officer of Nebraska Medicine. So welcome to all of you. And, and you can join the conversation tonight as well by calling us at 800-676-5446 or 402-472-1212. You can also send us an email at news at netnebraska.org. Well, Governor, more than 2,100 Nebraskans have contracted COVID-19. Today, 320 cases were confirmed, the biggest one-day increase by a large margin, and the most number of test results were also received with about 1,300 tests. But health officials say we should be testing at about 3,000 per day. So you announced a new initiative this week called Test Nebraska. And uh, my question, I guess, is will that be enough to get us where we need to be? And how fast can we get to where we need to be? Sure, absolutely. So we're really excited about testnebraska.com. We want Nebraskans to go sign up on this. We're in a little competition with Iowa. They've signed up more people than we have. So uh, please go to testnebraska.com. And then you can challenge five friends to do it through our, our challenge, hashtag Test Nebraska Challenge. So go out there and get people, uh, we'll use the viral media to get, fight the virus here. Mm -hmm. And so we expect with this program, we'll be able to stand up in about 10 days time, uh, our own lab to be able to do the type of testing we've been doing uh, and it's being done in other places around the country. And we should be able to ramp up in about five weeks time or so, about 3,000 tests a day. And you've, we had Dr. James Lawler on this program earlier. And that was the kind of the target that he had given us with regard to that's kind of where we need to be to be able to do more testing. Now, we're not going to stop just there. We're working to see what other types of ways we can expand testing as well. But that's kind of the program that we're rolling out right now for people to go on, take the assessment. It takes five minutes. Your data is secure in an encrypted database. And then we'll, as we get the lab set up, we'll start doing the testing with, again, people who are protecting us first, healthcare workers, law enforcement, first responders, firefighters, EMTs, all that then highly symptomatic people, then less symptomatic people, and then asymptomatic people as we have capacity. And we really want people to sign up so that we can get an idea of what's going on around the state, and that will also help us to be able to decide where we're going to start the testing, because we'll do drive-up testing by appointment around the state, try to make it easy on people. Uh, and this is a program that's already being done in Utah, so uh, we know that it works, we know that it, it can be done well, and so that's what we want to do here in Nebraska. And Iowa's doing it as well, correct? And Iowa's doing it too, so they announced the same day they are a little bit ahead of us as far as getting their lab set up, so they're, they're going to be up and running before us. But they announced the, the people signing up at the same time, so this is kind of where we're a little competition here. We, wanna, we don't want to fall behind Iowa. That would be a terrible thing. So do you think uh, there's been some talk about taking maybe five weeks to get to that maximum number of tests? Is it going to take us that long? Yeah. Uh, again, just like anything else, this is really kind of a production facility if you want to think about it. We've got to get the lab up and running. We've got to test it. We've got to get calibrated. And then what we'll do is we'll start rolling out the part where we test people. So we'll have tents set up. People will drive up by appointment. Uh, when they're operating at full capacity, it's about 500 tests a day. So we'll probably start with one test, get that kind of figured out, maybe staff with National Guard people. But then we'll have to you know, staff it with our own people. You know, we'll want to free up the National Guard folks to do other things. So we'll have to hire up to do that. So it will take us you know, probably about five weeks to be able to get up to the capacity where we've got uh, several of these sites rotating around the state doing that testing. So we'll talk more about testing, uh, Test Nebraska, but uh, Danette Smith, want to welcome you back as well. Thank and you for uh, me. the state's online dashboard includes information about the spread of COVID 19 in the state, and more information has been added to that dashboard recently, including the number of tests per day and the hospital capacity, like the number of ICU beds and ventilators that are currently available. So, how can we use this data? to maybe understand the spread of coronavirus and to make decisions about how to respond to it? Well, I think it's totally related to what you hear the governor talking about, which is really getting the testing done. But once the testing occurs and we have persons who may be positive, we can use that dashboard data to really predict where our next testing, but also where there's possibilities of more outbreaks and where we can utilize our hospital beds, our ICU beds, and our ventilators. It's a good predictor on helping us be able to manage the care of people in our community to get 
the treatment that they need. And so the dashboard not only tells that kind of data, but it's also telling us a lot of community data about who's affected, the age of the person, and, and why. Where did they reside? So that that information can help us predict where the next uh, occurrence can be. But not only that, in real time, help us take care of people right now. If I could jump in on that a little bit as well, Dennis, because uh, Dennis is exactly right. Take the recent example of Lexington. When we started testing there and we saw uh, the percent positive of these tests coming back being you know, 30 or 40 percent, we knew based on our experience from Grand Island at Hall County that we were going to see people coming into that hospital. Mm -hmm. And so that's when we started working with them. We knew that you know, several days from now we're going to start seeing more people coming in. And so we started making arrangements to transport people to make sure that you know, the ventilators that they had available at the hospital in Lexington would be available for people coming in and setting up the relationships so that we could move people to you know, Good Samaritan Hospital in Kearney or Great Plains Hospital in North Platte. And we're still making those arrangements right now as we look to see what's going to happen in Lexington. But as Danette said, when you do the testing and you see how that's coming back, that helps you look at, okay, we know how many ventilators, we know how many ICU beds, we can start making predictions about how many are going to be used, and we can use that to prepare before the patients actually show up. All right, Dr. James Linder, let's bring you in on this conversation a little bit. Uh, one factor health officials look to determine if they're doing enough testing is the positivity rate, yes. the percentage of total tests that are positive for COVID-19. So according to our analysis, the statewide average positivity rate was about 17% for the last week, which health officials say probably means there's not enough testing at this point. So, but if you look at certain communities, Individually, we see a different picture. So the rate in Douglas County is about 9%, and in Lancaster County, it's close to 7%. But in Hall County, where the Grand Island area has the highest concentration of cases in the state, you see 45% of all tests have come back positive. What do these rates, these positivity rates, tell us about the spread of disease in a community? Dennis, first, I'm really pleased to be with you and all Nebraskans tonight at this forum. Uh, I think information is critical for uh, relieving stress and doing good planning. Uh, one thing I wanna make sure people understand, when we talk about, say, 17% of tests being positive, those are the people that have been tested. And in all likelihood, you're testing people who are more symptomatic than the average Nebraskan. So it's not that you have 17% or 45% of citizens in the state that are positive with this virus. But understanding that positivity rate is essential for making the decisions on when certain activities occur, because the lower the positivity rate, the safer people can feel when they go out into the community. Um, we have a question that just came in over the phone. <clears throat> Dave from Douglas County, does the governor want everyone to check in with Test Nebraska or just those with symptoms? No, we'd love everybody to sign up for testnebraska.com. Uh, we want people to you know, fill out that profile and that will help us, again, make determinations about where we want to prioritize testing, where we want to do it, and that sort of thing. And also give us a, a broad picture of how many people might be symptomatic versus not symptomatic. Kind of get back to what Dr. Linder was saying. You know, when you've got, say, you're testing, say, in Omaha, 9% in the last week, I think you said, uh, we're testing positive. Well, that is useful to kind of know what's going on in Omaha, but if that's only those high probability cases we're testing. We'd like to know where we can't do testing, but if more people in Omaha fill out the test, we'll get a broader perspective of how many people are actually saying they're symptomatic, and that'll give us some data about, okay, we can test the really high-risk people, the people we really think have got the, the virus, and we're getting about 9% of those. But if we could look at broader, a broader section of, of Omahans that are filling out the assessment and know that this many people are saying they're symptomatic, but they're not maybe enough of a risk to go get a test, then we'll have a better idea of how spread the virus might be beyond just what we can test. Christine in Fremont asks, will the website testnebraska.com offer additional languages to reach multicultural populations? So the answer to that is yes. We are working on Spanish language version of that right now. Uh, it's coming out soon. Uh, so I'd say just stay tuned on that one. And, and that's one of the things that just in general we know we need to do a better job of. It's why I'm doing Spanish um, language press conferences now on Tuesdays and Thursdays at five o'clock central time is to really try and reach out to some of the communities where English is not the first language and try and reach the folks where they are. Staying with the testing and from Omaha says, I just took the COVID-19 assessment, wondering why there are no questions about travel if someone is asymptomatic. As you look to ramp up testing, I understand that asymptomatic people will be the last, but shouldn't those that have traveled be prioritized above those that have not? So when we first 
started looking at who we're going to test, like prioritizing who we were going to test. Travel was one of the big things we looked for because that was one of the indications that people were coming in. But, you know, we're kind of six weeks beyond that now. And so really a lot of the cases aren't related to travel anymore. It's more because people aren't traveling, right? Uh, but it's more related to community spread or they've been next to somebody who has already had the virus. So that's become a lot less important of a factor than just, just tell us what your conditions are. If she took it, she'll, you'll see we're asking for some of those underlying conditions that could put you more at risk for being more severely impacted by the virus. And so that's really kind of the stuff we're more interested in right now is, you know, prioritizing the people who may be symptomatic and have those um, high risk underlying health care conditions to prioritize them for testing first. Kelly from Omaha says the use of hydroxychloroquine to treat COVID-19 is controversial and reportedly poses many adverse risks for the patient. Why does the testnebraska.com site ask about allergies or adverse reactions to this drug? And furthermore, who would know the answer to this question if they've never taken the drug? Well, again, this is a broad survey for a lot of people to take the test, and there are people who are taking it for other reasons. And so you may know if you are adverse to that already. And if that does turn out to be a treatment, then again, it's one of the things that we would want to know with regard to what your treatment might be. So it, again, it's, it's interesting. I think probably the more interesting things when you fill out the survey is, you know, what are your underlying health care conditions, if any? Dr. Linder, I want to again bring you in on this, these anti-malarials that we've heard about. What's your opinion on them? How effective are they? I know there's, there's some in trials, I believe, right now. Uh, there are trials going on with hydroxychloroquine, and I think the only way we'll answer that question on its effectiveness is if you do have a well-controlled trial, because a report of five or 10 or 20 patients, some get better, some get worse, really doesn't tell you either the effectiveness or the magnitude of the side effects. And doctor, we've received several questions about this one from Kathy from Facebook. How many people have recovered? How many people are hospitalized or are most people quarantining at home? So a lot of people asking about uh, why don't we talk about the people who have recovered? First of all, if you consider 100 people who are exposed to the virus, 80% of those people have recovered and we may not even know they were sick because their symptoms were so mild. Of the other 20%, uh, some of those require hospitalization. And of those that do require hospitalization, uh, more than half are recovering. So it's a, a dynamic number and it depends again on uh, other comorbidities people may have and their age and other factors. So it's, it's not just a one number answer. Um, specifically in, in the Omaha area, we do track this as well though, as far as like how many people with COVID are in the hospitals. Again, this gets back to really monitoring the hospital capacity we have, which is the key that I'm looking at, you know, mm -hmm. making sure we don't overwhelm that hospital um, system. If you look, for example, we've got about, we actually, Omaha has actually transferred some ventilators out to help other hospital systems. Mm -hmm. uh, as of this morning, there were 389 hospital or uh, ventilators in Omaha. 96 of them were in use, so 75% were available, but only 21 of them were being used for COVID patients. And there were only about 40 COVID or 41 COVID patients in hospitals in the Omaha area. So you can see, again, to Dr. Linder's point, the vast majority of people who get this may not even know they've got it or may be so lightly impacted by it that they don't go see a doctor or don't get tested. But we, what we want to do is make sure for those folks who are going to be severely impacted, and it's generally older people with those underlying health care conditions, we want to make sure we've got those hospital beds available. Danette Smith, we're talking about a lot of numbers and are going to continue to do that. Um, Lisa from Lincoln talks about uh, data again. Can we get more details on the patients that have died in Nebraska? For example, age, gender, and race. So we know nationwide that groups like African Americans and Native Americans and Latinos are proving to be more susceptible to COVID-19. And the question is, why can't we get these demographic breakdowns in Nebraska so we can learn more about the impact of the virus here? Well, I think that we're uh, taking a look at that data, uh, trying to ensure that we're using that data the most appropriate the most appropriate way to tell a good story about really what's going on with communities of color. I think one of the things that we want to be very cautious about is not using data as a way to make people nervous, but to help people be more aware of what it means to be well even when you are a part of a community of color. I can certainly use myself as that example. I want to be able to use that data as a way to tell my community what's important about taking care of yourself. Many of us have pre-existing 
conditions. And so what is it that we need to be aware of in our community to stay safe? Because socializing and having relationships with other people in our community is very important. So we want to use that data to really talk about wellness. We want to use that data to talk about prevention. And what does that mean for us and how do we share it in a way to kind of push this whole virus knowledge and education forward so that people can live safe and well lives. From the data you've seen though, would you say that those trends that we've seen nationally about people of color being more affected are also the trends you're seeing in Nebraska? I think we're seeing some of those trends, but again, I don't want us to just use the data to look at it from uh, an, uh, a point of being discouraged. I want us to really look at that as a way of prevention. What can we do in our community to um, make us live good lives? And you can do that even with pre-existing uh, conditions, but you have to take the precautions. And one of the things that uh, the state is doing is we're offering tons of information on our website that talks about safety, how to live well, what you need to consider when you are asymptomatic or if you do have symptoms, what your next steps need to be regardless of your race. And do you ever think that some of that data that we've talked about will be released eventually? Yes, I do. Okay. You know, since the uh, comment on prevention was mentioned, I, I did bring a mask with me. This was uh, made by uh, uh, a friend and it uh, shows the Husker spirit. And I'd encourage anybody when a little they, shameless self-promotion there. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'd encourage anybody when they're out in public uh, to make sure they do have a mask for the reasons we've talked about before. One, it uh, protects your fellow citizens if you happen to be an asymptomatic carrier. And secondly, it may protect you. And uh, any closed space where you're in that situation, for example, carpooling, would be a good idea to make sure you have your face covering on. Good, good idea. We have another question from Andrew in Omaha. As we look to the future reopening of the state, it is apparent that contact tracing is a ne necessary tool to blunt the spread of COVID-19. How does Nebraska plan to expand its tracing capacity and how do we balance public health with privacy? Well, Andrew asked a great question because he's exactly right. The, the testing that we're uh, doing with testnebraska.com, and by the way, we want everybody to go sign up, testnebraska.com, uh, needs to go hand in hand with that contact tracing. So if you go to the website, you'll see it's assess, test, track. So what we want to do is track people down uh, who have, uh, you know, find people that have the virus and then find the people they've been associated with to let them know that they may have been exposed as well. So we get the person who tests positive for coronavirus, get them to isolate and then go to the, the folks they've been talking to and get them to quarantine so, to, until we discover whether or not they've actually got the virus as well. And Danette, I'm actually gonna throw this one to you because Please. you've been working on your team yes. about how we're gonna be expanding this. Uh, right now, the local public health departments do a majority of the contact tracing, but we at the state are expanding our team to be able to supplement them. So, so we're gonna be, bit? sure, we're gonna be working with the local public health departments, my uh, staff. We're looking at approximately 320 staff members who are actually going to help with some of that contact tracing. We're looking at working in six particular uh, counties or jurisdictions across the state that have really been hit hard. And what will happen is we've had 10, we're, we've designed 10 teams. Those 10 teams will include a team leader, five interviewers, and 25 contact tracers that will actually do the calls and ask the most pertinent questions about who you've been in contact with. We believe that this is going to help us be able to see what the results are and what the contacts have been. Uh, during this period. We're going to start Friday, this Friday, tomorrow, with uh, training of our staff, and we're going to be launching our first two teams. One team will go to the Grand Island, uh, Grand, yeah, Grand Island area, and then the second one is going up to the Madison County area. We want to hit, the, uh, make sure that we're working in concert with our local public um, health departments. So our 10 teams that we'll be using are going to be embedded into public health to be able to add, um, add additional support to them. And will we have a, additional teams at some point? That's right, additional teams. And so we're starting with our staff. We hope to kind of look at um, some other resources to help us get to that 1,000. The governor has given us a goal of having uh, contact tracers up to 1,000 persons, and we plan to get there, but we're starting uh, between now and the first week in May with 325 to help our local public health departments by being embedded. 
All right, we'll look for that. Governor, one more question on testing right now. Uh, it comes from a father in Omaha. Has a 38-year-old son who's disabled, lives at home, and is among those considered vulnerable. He says when Nebraska returns to normal, it will still not be normal for those who are vulnerable due to the risks that they'd be taking if they go outside. So he says for them to return to normal, he'd like to see testing for any individual having COVID-19 symptoms for at least a year. And there maybe should be a weekly summary of the number of tests, how many positive tests. So he wants to know if you'll commit to this additional testing so everyone, including the vulnerable, can return to normal. Well, I think it's premature for start, us starting to predict a year out right now because we still don't know a lot about this virus. But I think it is safe to say that people who are more vulnerable are going to have to be more careful as even as we start loosening some of these restrictions. And what we have with our Test Nebraska program is something that we expect to use through the balance of this year. So I can tell, tell, him, I can tell that father, we will definitely be testing through the balance of this year. How it plays out after that, a lot will depend, for example, when there's a vaccine, because I think when you have a vaccine, that changes the game, or effective antiviral medicines and so forth. But our plan with Test Nebraska, we've purchased 540,000 tests. Our plan is to you know, use those throughout the balance of this year to be able to do that testing here in the state of Nebraska. So definitely commit through the, the end of 2020. All right, a lot of questions on testing, but the most popular topic for questions submitted this week is Nebraskans wondering when businesses like beauty salons, barber shops, tattoo shops, and massage therapy centers can reopen. Many people are worried that uh, they'll be reopened too soon, while others are anxious to get back to work. So Jordan from Omaha sent us this video question. Hi, I'm Jordan from Omaha, Nebraska, and I wanted to ask you, Governor Ricketts, in what ways are you working with health officials and health departments to create updated sanitation guidelines for cosmetology professionals as you think about reopening salons? Additionally, how are you working to ensure that independent contractors, which make up a large portion of our industry, have access to unemployment benefits. As we know, many of them are applying for unemployment benefits, but are being denied. So a number of questions and as in that one bit question, but I know we got a There's lot. There's a lot to questions. unpack there. There's a lot to unpack. <laughs> so let's, right so let's, start, let's start with Jordan's first question. So we are working with our public health officials. And again, looking uh, at the state, not just as a one size fit all, but talking to public health officials in the different public health districts, we've got 19 of them. Um, having those conversations with them about their districts, also talking to the industry too, getting their feedback on what they would like to see or what are some of the things. Uh, and I will say specifically for the salon industry, we've gotten a lot of feedback from folks with regard to what they would like to see as we start opening those up. You know, and just to take a step back, you know, here in Nebraska, we, we actually only closed very few selected businesses. You, and I think you pretty much listed them all off. It was the salons and barber shops, it was the tattoo parlors, massage therapy, theaters, movie theaters, you know, indoor movie theaters, um, gentlemen's clubs, bottle clubs. So it was, it was really a very limited number of businesses we actually closed. And so as we start looking to, into May and loosening some of the restrictions, like Douglas County, Sar uh, Sarpy County, and Cass County's DHM, Directed Health Measure, expires on April 30th. So we've got to do something beyond that. We're not just going to let it expire and not do nothing. We get, we're going to continue to have these social distancing guidelines and so forth. We've been working with those folks to kind of come up with some ideas on what we would put out. So I'd say with regard to those specifics that Jordan's asked about, like how would a salon be able to open up? I would say stay tuned. The, we'll have an announcement on that. But you can imagine maybe, and it won't be exactly analogous, but when we talked, made our announcement this week about elective surgery, we said hospitals can do elective surgery if they have 30% of their hospital beds open, 30% of their ICU beds open, 30% of their ventilators open, and have two weeks of PPE. So we put conditions on it. And you can imagine we'd have similar sort of conditions for salons and, and so forth uh, like that. All right, and help me out. The second part of that question now was, oh, uh, uh, unemployment, right. Yes. So, um, you know, we've had John Albin, our unemployment commissioner, on um, the show. So, okay, uh, yes, all her folks who are independent contractors had to get rejected first because they're traditionally not eligible under the unemployment system. And that's, this is kind of the way the federal government works. They, the rules they wrote was said, you gotta apply for additional unemployment and get rejected. And if you get rejected, then you can apply for the pandemic unemployment assistance, okay? Now, that came out about three weeks ago when the legislation was signed, I mean, roughly. And our team launched today the software to be able to actually process the folks who qualify for the pandemic unemployment assistance, such as Jordan and her colleagues, 
right? They're independent contractors. So they wouldn't normally apply, be eligible, but now they will under the pandemic unemployment assistance program. So if somebody who is eligible goes on today, I mean, what had happened in the past is they got rejected. We kept, a, we kept that file. We're processing those applications right now. They don't have to do anything else. And then we'll get the pandemic unemployment assistance out to folks. And plus the 600 bucks that goes along with that too. If somebody goes on today, what they'll see is they'll go through the traditional unemployment uh, application, get rejected, but then walk you right straight into then doing that pandemic unemployment assistance application so that we can make that an, a better customer experience so that it's not quite so confusing. Mm -hmm. But it took us, you know, we had to develop the software for this. So we had to write it, test it, all that sort of thing. It took, you know, three weeks to get done, which is frankly record time to be able to do this. Uh, John Alvin and his team did a great job. So it should be a smoother process now for anybody who applies now. But if you've applied in the past, like Jordan and her colleagues, we are running the programs right now, the computer programs right now, to take those applications and process it. And those checks should be going out, you know, soon. One more question on this topic as well. Uh, Ellie in Scotts Bluff says, when and how will you reopen hair salons and tattoo shops? We talked about that. Many of these are run by self-employed individuals, and while it's a hardship to stay closed, they can't maintain social distance while performing their jobs. Mm -hmm. Wanted to specifically hit on the social distancing part of that. When these uh, shops do reopen, are you going to have very strict guidelines when it comes to social distancing? So, yeah, again, I'd say just stay tuned. We're going to have an announcement uh, on this. Uh, there'll be, a, you know, we'll be looking at new direct directed health measures for May. And so I'd say stay tuned for that. We'll have guidelines out there for the salons and so forth on how they can operate. So I'd say just, you know, hang with us here just a little bit longer. We, we know people are anxious to find out about it, and I get it. Um, but, you know, we're working to kind of pull all this together, and then we'll have some announcements. Dr. Linder, uh, Brooke from Omaha writes, there's talk about a second wave of COVID-19 coming. Any idea when, if it is coming, and the severity we could see? If I could answer that question definitively, <laughs> I would probably be on every network in the country. <laughs> uh, clearly, the virus is going to be with us for some period of time. We don't know what will happen during the summer. We don't know what will happen in the fall. We don't know the interaction between the coronavirus and other flu viruses. Uh, but uh, there are projections that we will have a second wave in the fall. We don't know its magnitude. I think what it does underscore is the need for continuing to follow the good recommendations we've had so far in terms of social distancing, washing your hands, don't touching your face. Uh, if we're in that capacity, we can navigate that wave because we will have a lower prevalence of the virus in our community. That will be just a small wave instead of a big wave. And I think uh, Dr. Linder makes an important point that, because I talked about releasing, you know, loosening up some of these restrictions in May, but it's going to be a step at a time loosening, and we're going to be social distancing for a while, right? So, uh, and it kind of gets back to the question about vulnerable people is that, you know, until there is a vaccine or we have very effective antiviral drugs or something that really changes the dynamic, you know, the whole idea is we're trying to slow the spread of the virus so we don't overwhelm the healthcare system, but it also means that we're going to be social distancing for a while. That, that all the kind of things that Dr. Linder is talking about, about washing your hands and keeping six feet apart and wearing masks and, and, you know, when you're in close proximity to people, we're going to be probably doing that for a while. Okay, we've got more questions to get to, but we want to remind you you're watching a special episode of Speaking of Nebraska with Governor Pete Ricketts, Department of Health and Human Services CEO, Danette Smith and Nebraska Medicine CEO, Dr. James Linder. Give us a call, 800-676-5446 or 402-472-1212. You can send us your questions on social media. You can find us on Facebook and Twitter at NET News Nebraska. Okay, we heard from several Nebraskans wondering when they can start attending religious services again. Betty in York asked, when will, we, when will we be able to attend daily mass? And Bill in Omaha sent us this video. I'm Bill from Omaha, but my question was, uh, do you plan on uh, meeting with uh, uh, worship centers uh, about developing best practices so that the, the uh, worship centers may open as uh, quickly as possible? I know at my church there's five or six things that we can easily do that we can maintain social distance and uh, minimize uh, any possible transmission of the virus. 
So, Governor, how much of a, of a priority is it for you to get people back in church? Yeah, it, it's a big priority for my administration to be able to make this happen. And, and first of all, I'd say today's the first day of Ramadan, so say happy Ramadan. And then also, please remember to celebrate at home with just your household, kind of like we ask people to do at Easter. And uh, I would say, you know, actually what Bill's asking for, we are already doing. Uh, the Lieutenant Governor has already reached out to faith communities to start getting feedback from them. Similar to what we talked about with the salons. Um, you know, really getting feedback from the people who are in the aisles, so to speak, and, and will have to manage this. So getting some of that ideas and what those feedback. So I'd say, again, just stay tuned. <laughs> That's coming as well. A lot. We, yeah, I was going to say, well, we know the end of the month is coming up. So these are, I mean, you, as you can see, it's a lot of things, a lot of people we have to reach out to. Um, and again, we want to check this all off with all of our public health people as well. So we've been getting that feedback. Uh, and we will make an announcement with regard to religious services. So I'd say just, just be patient here for a few more days. We'll, you'll have some information on it. Danette Smith, um, one of the uh, facilities you oversee, Youth Rehabilitation and Treatment Center in Kearney. We know earlier in the month that they experienced several cases. Can you give us an update on staff and residents there? Are we seeing uh, any more cases of COVID-19? So the good news is no, we aren't. Um, we uh, still have a few staff who are out sick, but not necessarily for COVID. Most of those staff that were exposed to uh, the COVID virus are coming back to work. As you're aware, we had three young persons who we ended up having to quarantine and they are doing fine. Uh, they are back in uh, with the uh, general population and doing very well. And so I'm really happy to report no additional cases in terms of my staff and no additional kids, uh, cases with the youth. Just so that your viewers are aware, they got wonderful care. Staff, uh, the same staff that began the caretaking responsibilities, did it for 14 days continuously. And so I think my young men got spoiled out there, but they're back to normal programming and we're happy about that. And a couple other programs I wanna ask you about. Sure. SNAP, the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. I know you're uh, looking at trying to ease or already have actually eased some of those uh, requirements and also WIC. Uh, are you seeing a lot more applications for those programs? So yes, let me talk a little bit about SNAP. We are seeing a, an uptick in our SNAP applications. In fact, um, from the beginning of March, we started with approximately 1,500 calls. We're now averaging between 2,200 calls for SNAP applications or at least for benefits. Uh, during the month of March, we had several days that we were in about 3,100 calls a day. Uh, my staff are averaging approximately 250 applications a day, and we are trying to process those applications as fast as possible. The other thing that we're trying to do is we're going to be working with the call center, and that call center is going to be taking calls so that we have no wait times. We want to be able to provide services to people in real time. So there's a call center that's going to be helping us with answering questions, shepherding those questions, and even ha uh, helping us with our customers to even apply for benefits. And so that's on tap. We've also uh, put into use a new technology system where the caller calls in, they wait on the queue, and we're able to pick their call up right away because what we want to do is decrease the abandonment. We want to make sure that we serve everybody that, that is calling us. So yes, we're seeing an increase in our SNAP benefits. I'd like to talk a little bit about WIC if I can. Real quickly. Okay, so WIC uh, program is a wonderful program. We want to make sure that we get services out to women and and children with uh, between the ages of zero and five. WIC allows us to provide formula and all those things that are needed for very, very young children. And we've got to figure out how we get those benefits more to the community instead of having them come in. There's been some relax in some of the expectations in that the mother does not have to show up with their child, but they can just show up to get their benefits or at least to sign up for it. We serve in Nebraska close to 33 thousand women and so we want to see that increase. I have up to 2.2 million dollars that I can use on my WIC program and so my staff and I are going to be looking at some creative ways to get those benefits out to the community and out to women and children who need it. All right we'll look for those. Uh, Dr. Linder uh, I want to ask you a little about uh, something Governor Ricketts did. By the way you just touched your nose Dennis. I know I did. 
Sorry. Got to put five dollars in the bin. <laughs> Where's the kitty? Um, so it relaxed uh, the, the for dentists. I mean, dentists yes. can go back to work in early May. Um, but we have a number of questions. Uh, Duressa from Omaha, I'm a dental hygienist. What protections are going to be provided to dental workers and the patients coming into these office? Dental is the top aerosol creating field in medicine. We can uh, clean surfaces but not the air. In order to work that closely uh, a a with OSHA standards as well, would we need N95 masks, face shields, and gowns? Are you aware those supplies are not widely available? What do you propose we do? So between the governor and, and we'll start with Dr. Linder there, how dangerous should it, how concerned should dental hygienists be going back into the office? I think whenever there's an aerosolizing procedure uh, in an individual uh, that you need to take precautions with the right personal protective equipment and that would include masks and face shields uh, because many people their status of the uh, coronavirus infection is just going to be unknown so it has to be done in order for those individuals to do their work safely. And Lynette in Columbus asked the question along those same lines. So since we're opening up these elective surgeries and dentists and vets in May, have you considered requiring that the healthcare worker and the patients both have tests completed that show they are negative for COVID-19? So, well, you want to take that one? Well, we're actually, <laughs> actually, I spent two hours discussing this tonight because yeah. Nebraska Medicine is in the process of rescheduling people whose procedures had been postponed. And our policy will be that those individuals will be tested to make sure that they are not carrying the virus before they come in for that procedure. That's safer for the provider. It's safer for the patients. We want people to feel confident that when they do come into a healthcare facility, uh, every precaution has been taken. Mm -hmm. So I think that when you're talking about dentists, though, it's going to be a little bit different scenario because, again, the test generally takes, you know, 24 to 48 hours to get turned around back to somebody. So if you're playing an elective surgery, that's, that's a relatively easy thing to do versus if you're walking into your dentist's office. But I do think that what the Dental Association is doing is working on some guidelines to be able to publish for dentists, to be able to make sure that, you know, getting specifically at the ideas that um, the folks were talking about with regard to personal protective equipment, what is going to be the new standard? Uh, obviously, dentist's office already are used to being able to protect the people who work there as well as the patients. And, you know, again, it's a healthcare field. So I think that what you're going to see is that level of uh, protection is, is going to go up. It is probably going to, for example, involve face shields. I haven't actually seen the guidelines from the Dental Association yet, but um, I think you can expect there are going to be a, a higher degree of pr uh, protection required for those dentists to be able to perform the teeth cleaning or whatever it's going to be. Before we get to our next topic, a follow-up question from Rick in Lincoln uh, for you, Danette Smith, CEO of Health and Human Services. Where do you apply to become a COVID contact tracer? Well, we're going to be taking uh, volunteers, and so I would suggest that he contact my public health uh, department, and we can certainly get him signed up to help us. All oh, right. just so we're clear, though, we're going to pay people to do this. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so she we says, are. Yeah, so I think that's a great step, though, is contact your local public health department. That's right. And we should actually, uh, again, what we're focused on right now is taking some of our current teammates at the state of Nebraska and getting them trained up so we can get a, a cohort done really quickly. And we're going to be looking long. Again, this is something, can, just like the testing, this is going to be something that we're going to be doing the rest of the year. So we want to create a team that is going to be there to supplement the public health departments. So uh, we do need to create a way for people to be able to apply and, and that sort of thing. But I think starting with the public health department is a great place. And I would recommend that he probably contact uh, his local public health department. Okay. We'll have him do that. Uh, Governor, I want to talk about uh, meatpacking plants. Uh, just throw some numbers. Officials say at least 230 workers at the JBS meatpacking plant in Grand Island have tested positive for COVID-19. Numbers of cases in Dawson County, where there's a Tyson plant in Lexington, have spiked. Uh, officials aren't saying how many of those are plant employees. Been at least 40 cases at a Tyson plant in Madison. Cases in Dakota County, where there's a Tyson plant in Dakota City, more than doubled from Wednesday to Thursday, where they stood at 246. Um, what, what are we doing? We have a question from Doug from Tilden. He wants to know more about what's happening at the Tyson plant in Madison. I know you had a couple of people from UNMC uh, who have... People who have been on the show, as a People who have both been on this show, Dr. Yeah. James Waller and, uh, and uh, Shelley uh, Sweethelm. Sweethelm. Sweethelm, yes. Yeah. Uh, and they both went out and toured some of these plants this week. What, what did they come back and tell you about? Yeah, so a uh, couple things. So we're working closely with the food processors 
to be able to help them with their social distancing and helping them keep their teammates safe as well as continue to be in operation. It's important to keep the folks safe and it's also important that we continue in operation. So uh, Shelley and uh, Dr. Uh, Lawler, who has both been on here, went around touring actually last week and this week, a number of facilities. And when they came back, they actually told me they were very impressed with what the steps the um, the folks at Tyson and JBS and so forth, those companies were doing to be able to do more social distancing. Uh, I know at the Lincoln Premium Poultry Plant, for example, where they had somebody who was uh, slicing up chicken breasts, they actually were building a tent around that person's workstation to be able to do it. At some of these other facilities, have been putting up plexiglass walls between workstations, uh, doing more sanitizing, everybody's wearing masks, they're putting up plexiglass in lunchrooms so people eat essentially in a phone, book, uh, phone booth. They've been uh, spreading out people. Um, taking temperatures of people coming into the facility. So there's a number of things, and but still with room to improve, but that's what Shelley and Dr. Lal were doing, is really working with them to be able to figure out how they could do it. But by and large, they came back and said they were impressed. Uh, we are also working with uh, local public health directors on supporting them. So for example, uh, a lot of the folks who work at these facilities, English isn't their first language. And so we've been challenged to be able to reach out to those families to help them with that social distancing. And so I've started doing Spanish language press conferences on Tuesdays and Thursdays at five o'clock central time to be able to help get that message out. We're translating all my press releases into Spanish. We're doing social media in Spanish. I know CHI Francis in Grand Island is doing, taking out ads in Spanish to be able to help reach those communities. So uh, we're looking for, uh, Danette talked about some of the people that they're trying to work with to get those local community leaders to reach out to those communities. So we're putting a lot of effort in not only the work side of it, but think about this, you know, two thirds of the time they're gonna be spending is gonna actually be at home. And so getting the message out about the six foot distancing, but also just like, hey, if you're carpooling, wear that mask that you know, Dr. Linder has and only have two people in the car, one in the front, one in the back, unless it's your household. Or if you can count, you know, just carpool with your household, that's a great step. Don't share food, bring your own lunch. You know, these are some of the, the things that we wanna communicate out to folks that will help us slow down that spread that is not specifically plant related, but is about the home related that we need to focus on too. So, and that's just one of the communities. We've got communities that, you know, uh, are the Karen communities or the Ethiopian or the Somalian communities. You know, there's different communities out there we've got to reach out to as well to be able to connect with. So, uh, in addition to that, we've deployed the National Guard to do more testing. We've, the, and that's already talked about the contact tracing. So we are deploying resources to these areas. And we know that if you look at the state of Nebraska right now, while Omaha and Lincoln are doing pretty well, if you look at where the cases that are, are popping up, they are in these cases like Hall County, Dawson County, Dakota, Madison. Um, you know, those are the counties that we are really focusing on right now. We had one question that came in about are all large manufacturing and meat processing plants being inspected for safe distancing between workers, protective equipment, and protocols for don donning masks and gloves and proper disposal? So again, that's what Shelley and Dr. Lawler are doing. They're going out. And this is not an inspection per se. This is not regulatory. This is about best practices. And in fact, actually, one of the things I failed to mention is that I have weekly calls now with uh, all the food processors to go over these types of best practices. Uh, and we also have been taking feedback from, um, like Eric Reeder sent me a document to share with him. He's the president of UFCW Local 293, representing the food workers. And so he's sharing his comments. So we're you know, really working to get a best practices model out there for all these processors, because it's not a competitive thing, right? They should all be doing everything they can to be able to take these best practices and, and employ them so they can you know, keep people healthy in their plants and again, stay in operation. So Pat from Facebook says, what are your plans on expanding testing in Western counties? It seems to be following the I-80 corridor. Five weeks is not soon enough with all the people coming in from Colorado to their vacation homes. Well, so uh, with regard to specifically people coming in for vacation homes, they're supposed to quarantine for two weeks before they go anywhere. So if you are coming back from say Florida or Arizona, one of those snowbirds, you gotta quarantine for two weeks. If you're coming back to your cabin here in Nebraska, quarantine for two weeks. So that's the, the first step I would say out there. And uh, similar to what we've done in other areas, when we've seen that we think we maybe have something, so we've talked about you know, the food processors, but nursing homes also fall in that area where you have high concentrations of people. And um, that's also where we've experienced some of these outbreaks. So for example, we had that in Kimball County. We mobilized the National Guard to go to Kimball County, do a lot of testing. And in that case, we found out that it was really pretty much related to the nursing facility. We tested 50 people and the only person that tested positive was the person we already knew was positive. So 
we do deploy uh, to different counties when we start seeing a rise in incidences, and we'll continue to do that. Dr. Linder, we had a question that came in. What are the long-term health effects of COVID-19 on the heart, lung, kidney, and cognitive functions? These are studies that are actively being uh, conducted right now. Uh, it, I think it's safe to say that as we approach the end of April, the impact on other organs in the body is more severe than we would have thought in early March. Uh, so we need to understand that in terms of how it affects people's overall wellness, their susceptibility to other infections, how it amplifies or affects any underlying conditions. And all the organs you mentioned, as well as, as, as probably others, are, are under study. So there's a lot of testing going on in the medical community. Is Nebraska Medicine involved in any of that testing? And are we seeing any promise from any of the tests that are out there? Testing for the virus or for a prior exposure to the virus? Well, for uh, like anti-malarials and things that could possibly address the situation. Uh, Nebraska Medicine was one of the first sites to be involved in the remdesivir study. And that study has completed its enrollment uh, and is in the process now of being analyzed. And then there are, are studies that are building off that that Nebraska Medicine is involved in. Uh, so we think this is very important. Um, a vaccine is going to be a long-term solution. But if we have good therapeutics that can treat somebody who starts having early symptoms and mitigate the severe symptoms, we'll all be much more comfortable with this virus in the community. And just to put a plug in for testnebraska.com, that's another reason why we should have people sign up. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, one other uh, thing that's been mentioned about is using plasma from recovered patients. Now, yes. Is that showing any promise? Yes, that is showing good progress and promise. Uh -huh. uh, you know, it's currently there's a, a need to develop a more of a standardized product uh, because one person's plasma may not have the level of antibodies as another's. So many of the pharmaceutical companies are working together to make sure that uh, uh, there is a plasma that can be used therapeutically to lessen the severity of infections. Uh, Governor, I want to ask you a question from Jeanette in Lincoln. I have not seen or heard Governor Ricketts or President Trump address any relief or help for the agricultural community. Crop prices are very low, and now with the packing plants experiencing shutdowns and delays, the market for beef and pork is very concerning. Farmers are experiencing a scary time in planting, not knowing if they're going to recoup costs for their product, and ranchers are calving right now with no market for their product. There's talk of a stimulus for the entertainment industry, but no talk of helping these essential folks within our food supply chain. Yeah, so first of all, again, this is one of the reasons why it's so important to keep our food processing plants open, to have a market for our farmers and ranchers to be able to send their animals. So that's another great reason why we need to do it. Also, uh, one of the things that Janet did not mention, but it is a, is a problem as well, is the ethanol industry already under pressure uh, before this happened. And now with low uh, oil prices and gas prices, Many ethanol plants are shutting down, and that's, a, that's where about 40% of our corn crop goes. So that's a, that's a big concern. In fact, I was on the phone with uh, Secretary, U.S. Secretary of Agriculture, Sonny Perdue, talking about that problem as well as the food processor problem. And then, um, but uh, I actually, uh, just within the last couple of days, USDA has announced a program. It's about $19 billion. That will be directed in relief for uh, farmers and ranchers. It's about $16 billion in direct relief to farmers and ranchers and about $3 billion that will go to purchase food for, you know, like uh, dairy, meat, fresh produce, and supply those to food banks. So finding, again, a kind of market for some of their products. So that program is relatively new. A lot of the details are not out there yet how that's going to work, but uh, uh, help is on the way from the USDA with regard to that. Another economic question. Brent from Omaha, will, will you be doing any legislation or directives towards commercial property owners regarding tenants' rent. I own a restaurant, and we are being threatened with eviction due to not being able to pay rent when I am limited in what I can do for sales. The Paycheck Protection Program money does not cover the amounts due. Yeah. So with regard to rent, well, the first thing, uh, and we've started talking about this right off the bat, is I encourage everybody to go talk to your landlords, go talk to your banks, uh, figure out what you might be able to do with regard to that. I'd certainly encourage landlords to... Um, you know, make sure that they're being as flexible as they possibly can be with their tenants. Also, I signed an executive order that actually pushed off the date of any of these evictions from having to, usually there was a law in place that said they had to be done within two weeks, and I pushed that off till after May. So um, now there's, that doesn't mean that all, and it has to be COVID uh, virus related to be pushed off. 
and it doesn't cover things like if you've got a criminal record or if you're damaging, you know, vandalizing the property or whatever it is. So it doesn't cover those things. But um, you know, pushing that off to um, you know after May. Uh, Danette Smith, uh, Linus from Hastings, uh, asks about Medicaid expansion. Linus says, before COVID-19, we were tired of waiting. Now some of us are sick and waiting for you and your team to cut through the bureaucracy and get this done. Are we still going to have to wait until October to go live? We are still going to wait until October to get it done. But the good news is we're going to be taking applications beginning uh, in August. We are excited about the expansion of Medicaid um, and we're going to be prepared to serve approximately 94,000 uh, residents here in Nebraska. And so, yes, we're on target. Um, our uh, 1115 waiver, we are waiting on approval from CMS on that, but that is not going to stop us from going ahead and initiating the program in October. Was there ever any talk about trying to expedite that, tried to move it closer? I know we, we said we've had to wait to October. Could we do it uh, sooner if we want? You know, we couldn't, and here's why. CMS has a process that they must follow in order to authorize us for any of the waiver movement, which is the 1115. Those were one of the questions that I asked when I went to D.C. about a year ago, and the answer was no, because there is a series of processes that we do have to go through on the application process. But the good news is that the technology is ready, the staff is being trained, and we're going to be ready to execute our applications in August to begin the program October 1. And if I could jump in on that too, you know, Danette talked about 94,000 people. That's a significant number of people. Yeah. So we have to have the software built. It's being tested right now. If we were to try and change that, that would start the process all over again and put that August 1st date at risk. Uh, we also, as Danette mentioned, we have to train up people to be able to take those, uh, you know, to work with folks and get the applications all processed and everything like that. So this is not, uh, you know, this is a, not a, a small project. This is a large project. And we have to work with all of our managed care organizations, and they've got to change their software, too. And it's all got to be tested to make sure it works. What's happened in other states that have rushed this process is they've signed up a bunch of people who don't qualify. So, for example, in California, they know that every year they're paying out $700 million to people who do not qualify for this program. And there's another $400 million that they're paying out to people who they think probably don't qualify, but they don't know. And that's the risk of going fast, is that you end up making mistakes, you sign up people who aren't qualified to be able to receive the benefits, and that's taking money away from people who are qualified to receive the benefits. And I would add to that, that we really want to make sure that our system is ready. The people who we qualify who say are eligible, we really want to be able to serve them. We also want to make sure that our MCOs are ready to go, they're in a good partnership, they have been tested, their software has been tested, their, all of their processes are in place. And so this is a big lift for the department, but the department is prepared to do it. And so we're looking forward to implementing October 1. It's a process that I know Nebraskans want us to do, and they want us to be thorough in it. And so I think we're going to be, I know we will be ready October 1st. Dr. Linder, a question from Brooke and Lincoln. Wouldn't it be better to roll out antibody testing for everyone? That would be more than just a snapshot of a COVID-19 test at that specific moment, which can change the next day. If we found out who all has the antibodies, then we could get back to work uh, and get back to normal so much sooner. So antibody testing has been in the news. There are a variety of tests that are emerging. Uh, not all of them have been fully vetted yet to determine their accuracy. Uh, within the next uh, two weeks, Nebraska Medicine will be bringing their testing online, and uh, we've designed it so that it's possible to do high-volume testing so we can get a better idea of the uh, percentage of people in the population who are antibody positive. Now, antibody positivity doesn't mean you're superhuman because it differs from individual to individual, and we're not going to know until some time has passed how long that immunity lasts. But it will be an important data uh, in terms of the overall decision on bringing the communities back to work. Can you give us a ballpark figure of what the percentage of patients in your facilities are COVID-19 positive right now and how, or, and how many others are in there for something else? Uh, at Nebraska Medicine, a relatively small number of individuals are hospitalized that are COVID-19 positive, let's say a dozen. And we might have uh, twice that many that are in a rule out status. They've come in with symptoms, we've collected a sample and we're testing it. Uh, so it's a small percent, again, because of the good measures that have been taken 
uh, in, in our geographic area. And we like to keep that number very low. Okay, as we wind down, Governor Ricketts, I'm going to turn to you again and, and say that uh, this week has been a lot about testing. We've seen some of the numbers uh, increase a little bit across the state, but that's something we're going we're gonna to see as we get more testing. We're going to see those numbers increase, correct? Yeah, that's one of the things we've told people is that as we increase testing, we will see more positives because we know there's more people out there that have the virus that, than we were able to test. And so we want to expand testing, and that's why we launched the program TestNebraska.com. We really want people to go sign up for that assessment. It will take us about 10 days to get our lab set up, and then it will take time to ramp it up. It's going to take about five weeks to get to that capacity of 3,000 tests a day. But then we'll be able to really do some robust testing. And then to the point we were making earlier, that contact tracing. So finding the people who were tested positive, tracing back all their contacts, asking them to quarantine so we can really focus on you know, getting those folks who have been exposed to quarantine so they don't expose anybody else. And this is going to be a, a really important way for us to be able to slow the spread of the virus again. Was this part of the original plan, or is this a shift in the plan? No, no, this is always part of the plan to be able to expand the testing and do more contact tracing. It's, I mean, I don't want to sound like a doctor here because I'm not, but it's kind of standard epidemiology, right? Contact tracing is so important because viruses, once you develop immunity, they cease to exist unless you can pass that virus on to somebody else. So if we can quarantine those people and stop that spread, that's what eliminates the virus from our community. All right, so in 20 seconds... We're, we're moving forward, we're on the right track. Yeah, absolutely. So if you look at Nebraska, the plan we've implemented is working, right? We have not overwhelmed the healthcare system. That's the whole key. We published a dashboard on our DHHS website. It shows that, you know, we've got like 34, 36% of hospital beds available, 46% of ICU beds, and 75% of ventilators. The plan is working. We're going to ramp up that testing. Go t sign up at testnebraska.com. All right. That is all the time we have for tonight. Thanks to Governor Pete Ricketts, also to Dr. James Linder, Thank you. and to Danette Smith, and to our NET crew behind the scenes working to bring this program to you. You can watch tonight's program online at netnebraska.org slash coronavirus, and you can also send us your questions for next week's live town hall with Governor Ricketts on another special episode of Speaking of Nebraska. That's going to come up next Thursday at 8.30 Central on NET, NET Radio, and streaming online as well. Until then, I'm NET News Director Dennis Kellogg. Thank you for watching. <laughs>